guess who's coming to dinner? This guy, yes, I am back, and this is Sports Zone. Hello, and welcome to Sports Zone. I am your host, triumphantly returning from a, uh, a hiatus or an exodus to uh, Ben Florence. Uh, welcome back to the show. We got some excellent stuff for you. On my left, we got Tyler. Oh, that's right, Tyler, you're not here. So. Yeah. We still don't know what we're doing with this, do we? So, Michael uh, uh, and Michael Gardner's not, uh, he's out actually shooting a sitcom right now. Um, yeah, legitimately, too. Really? So, we got uh, Dylan Schoenhall, who you hosted last week. Admirably, yep. my mind, Ed. I must say, I was shocked. <laughs> we actually did an episode last week, so. Hey, we got it done, and it came out, came out pretty good, I think. Eh. Not, not our best work. Yeah. But. Yeah. Anyway, so we're going to start off with a little college basketball talk, which has been short, sorely missed on this show, I've noticed, this semester. But the, cl- the calendar struck March, and thus everyone's talking about because the NCAA tournament, Selection Sunday, is two weeks from today. We're taping on a Sunday, the 2nd of March. Mm-hmm. Uh, and all the real big topics people want to talk about, Wichita State, first team to, uh, to go 30-0, and now 31-0 and since UNLV in the early 90s. They ended up losing to Duke in the national championship game. That was a classic Jerry yep. Canyon team. But uh, Wichita State, they haven't played a tough schedule. Missouri Valley has been atrocious this year, especially after Creighton left for the new Big East. And so while they're projected to be a number one seed, Dylan, are, if they go out, because if they lose in the Missouri Valley tournament at any point, they're not going to be a one seed. I'll tell you right now. No. But if they go undefeated and – even with a less than stellar uh, schedule that they've played, are they deserving of a number one seed? I think if they do win out, that they do deserve a number one seed. The biggest reason for that is the fact that some of the other teams underneath them have slipped up. When you think Syracuse has lost, how many, two or three recently, Kansas just lost, Duke UNC, Duke lost. I mean, they beat Syracuse, which was a big win for them. But I think Wichita State, undefeated, if they win out, they have to give them a number one seed. They have a really weak schedule, so it's, I'm not surprised that they're undefeated. But where else are you going to put them just based off of how they've done for the entire season? It's, it's one of those Cinderella story kind of moments where they almost kind of need to be the first, the, one of the number one seeds. Well, I mean, you say Cinderella, but this is a team that went to the Final Four last year. So it's not like a team that has come out of nowhere. They returned basically this entire cast, Cam mm-hmm. Gurley, uh, Ron Baker, Fred Van Vliet, you know, Greg Marshall, excellent coach. Yeah. And, you know, they do have some solid wins. They beat St. Louis at St. Louis. St. Louis right now, although they just lost Saturday night to Xavier, mm-hmm. um, is ranked 10th in the country. Yeah. And St. Louis is a good team, too. Yeah. You can't, well, you can't just count them. 10th in the country. Exactly. So they, they've been on a roll before, again, losing to Xavier. But another team that seems like a lot to be a one seed, and they're number one right now, the only team ahead of Wichita State, the Florida Gators. Widely expected to play very well uh, this year, but they weren't expected to win the SEC, which has just been awful this year. I mean, Georgia's in third place in the SEC. Georgia. But uh, you look at Florida, a team that probably doesn't have NBA, any NBA prospects. I mean, you got a bunch of very good players. But not a lot of guys that look like they can do get it done at the next level. But they've got their they can shoot, they play solid offense, they're excellent defensively. Billy Donovan has been there and done it before in the NCAA tournament. Is Florida right now where you know you, you talk about teams slipping up? Syracuse, uh, uh, you have uh, Kansas, uh, some other teams. Arizona's lost of late, yep. uh, although they've kind of gotten it together. Uh, do you think Florida right now is the best team in America and the team to beat? I think, like you just said, just because other teams have slipped up and they're the number one seed, I do think they're the number one team to beat right now. They have a good cast, and like you said, Donovan is a coach. He's done it before. He's a really good coach, and the, the other talent just isn't there at the top. I know we were talking right before we got on to tape the segment, the possible number one seeds, and it's Florida, Wichita State, Kansas, possibly, and then Arizona. When you think of some of the number one seeds over the past 10 years even, we're thinking Syracuse, Duke, UNC, Louisville, all those big power schools, and those don't seem to be here. They've kind of slipped up recently, which I think definitely elevates Florida's importance and 
kind of defends their fact that they're the number one seed right now, which puts them ahead of all the other teams. Yeah, you know, well, I mean, yeah, Florida is still, like, you know, a soft power. They're the last team in several years to win back-to-back mm-hmm. titles. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, it seemed like last year there wasn't a going into, like, conference tournament play. There really wasn't a team to beat. And then you saw Louisville just dominate the Big East tournament, just kick ass. Pardon my French, but, you know. They did. They, 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 they really they did. They kicked ass. Yeah. And last year, the old Big East. And then they became the presumptive favorite and then went on to win the title. So maybe somebody, maybe Syracuse will get their act together. Duke possibly. Uh, Arizona, they, they will, uh, they've they been a little hit or miss. Yeah. Um, I mean, all it takes is for one of those teams, one of the perennial powerhouses, to go on a run like that. Yeah. They just need to get it together. And again, like maybe Syracuse has been trying some different things. Maybe they've been trying to rest some players. I mean, I haven't watched a ton of Syracuse games, but they just yeah. don't seem to be playing as well as they were at the beginning yeah. of the season. So now that it's playoffs, I think they're going to get it back together. They make a run. Duke, a rematch against UNC this upcoming weekend, maybe they make a run and see where it goes from there. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, Syracuse did also. They're losing a week and a half. Yeah. They started with losing to Boston College. Boston College is pitiful. Yep. I think AU could actually beat Boston College. We'll, but we'll talk more about AU basketball a little later on in the show. But we got some more greatness coming up on the way. You are watching Sports Zone. Be right with Ryan. Hello and welcome back. This is Sports Zone. Hopefully, you guys remember me hosting this special segment, especially after last week where I was hosting most of them. But this is Getting to Third Base, your favorite, one of your favorite segments that we have here. Joined by two other guys to my left right here. We got Deepak. And a new guy joining us this week. Hopefully, he's going to be sticking around for a few weeks. Dan, I know he said he can talk about baseball and football. Well, baseball's heating up, and that's exactly what we're going to be focusing on right now. But spring training started. Games are starting. Players are working out. Everything's looking great, except for those injuries. And that's one of the big things that's been happening so far this spring. And that's one thing that's really caught a lot of attention on ESPN and MLB.com. And I'm not just talking about minor league players not working out enough over the offseason. I'm talking about big-name guys. We got Josh Hamilton, Zach Greinke, C.J. Wilson, Jose Iglesias. A lot of big-name players are getting injured. A lot of them aren't that major of injuries, though, some calf injuries, some arm injuries. Deepak, yeah. do you see any of these injuries causing some serious effects over the year? Um, the Seattle Mariners, uh, it's coming out of their organization. You, you've lost two great pitchers in terms of, you know, their number two, Hisashi Iwakuma, who had a phenomenal season last year at Taiwan Walker, who is their number one prospect, who is fighting for that four or five spot. Arm injuries are always a scary thing. Uh, Iwakuma is slightly more extreme than Walker, uh, and that's going to set them back a few, a few games because after all the stuff they've done this offseason, um, can't. Um, you know, it, it's a little scary to see what's going to happen. All right. So moving from one set of pitchers to another pitcher, I know, Dan, back in the back room, you were talking about another pitcher that you're kind of worried about, right? Yeah, the pitcher I'd be worried about is Zach Greinke. Now, he left his last start after four pitches, which is never a sign you want to see from your pitcher, especially one as good as Greinke, who's really – he can't be the ace because you got Clayton Kershaw, but he's 1A, as, as they would say. And it certainly, it's certainly, I believe it's a calf injury. It's going to throw off his whole spring training regimen. I mean, they said he's gonna, probably going to, he might miss his next start. It really puts him up in the air for the beginning of the season because if he misses, you know, he threw four pitches. If he misses another start, will he be ready? You know, he's, Coach Don Mattingly had already said that he wanted his pitchers to get a few, four or five starts in spring training. Grink is in danger of missing that. And it could cost him going to start the season in Australia as the Dodgers are starting the season overseas. He said he didn't really want to go anyway. Exactly. But I'm sure he'd rather not be injured. Yeah, Yeah, obviously. And like I said beforehand, a lot of these injuries aren't that major. A lot of the teams are reporting. I know Josh Hamilton, they're saying he may be out for the first week or two. Green Key may miss a start. So nothing's really serious. But you have to think, if they get injured this early in the season, this early in spring training, that might continue throughout the rest of the season, which is, I think, where a lot of people are worried. And, and you saw what happened last year, too, with Matt Kemp, um, who was injured for most of the season, as it was. I understand Greinke was injured for part of that season due to the broken collarbone with the little scuffle with um, Carlos uh, Quinton. Yep. However, you know, considering Kemp was injured that whole time, 
that set them back until a man named Yasiel Puig came into the picture, and they just they sh skyrocketed into the into the postseason. Yeah, no, they definitely did. Now to move from one side of injuries to another side, there's reports that Matt Harvey's coming back, and he's throwing strong again after coming off some injuries. Deepak. Yeah. He's coming back pretty soon. Do you think that they're rushing him too much, or do you think he's actually ready? I, I think that he may actually be ready. Um, you know, I'll, the Mets, they're, they're kind of desperate. Um, <laughs> you know, after showing what they did last year, that they started competing late in the season. Um, <clears throat> they want Harvey back, but they understand that having a guy who is legitimately going to be an ace in the league for a few years, um, you know, it's huge. Um, you know, hearing that a guy who just had Tommy John, what, four months ago, five months ago, you know, is already beginning to throw, that's almost unheard of. I mean, a lot of the times they're still resting, trying to go through the slow rehab, so it's a, it's a good sign. Uh, yeah. you know. No, it definitely is. Now, Dan, I know you mentioned that you are a Mets fan, so seeing <coughs> Harvey go down was probably devastating. Seeing Harvey come back is probably absolutely amazing. But do you feel that they're rushing him here? Like Deepak said, it's been four or five months. He's already starting to throw. Usually this is a nine-month to a year injury, and he's coming back within five months. Do you think that this will hurt him in his career and cut it short? I think, I think we all know how tough Matt Harvey is. I mean, there's the famous game he pitched through the first inning with a bloody nose and I think struck out the side or whatever he yeah. did. But I think, I think it's not always up to the player when he comes back. The team is going to play this very carefully. They, pitching is something they're very deep in, especially with their farm system. They've got five pretty solid starters, four pretty solid starters and are competing for that fifth spot, plus at least two prospects that are probably start the season in AAA. So starting pitching is something that the Mets have in a lot of depth. I don't expect them to push Harvey too quickly, even if he wants to come back, and I'm sure he does. Yeah. In addition to Harvey, you've got someone who pitched pretty well for them last year as a fifth starter, Jeremy Hefner, who had Tommy John surgery two months before Harvey, he'll also be on his way back this season. So there's no reason for the team to really throw Harvey out there before he's ready unless they're in real contention for that division come the end of the season. So I think the team will be very conservative with him. Right. And I mean, I guess the one thing you definitely need to worry about is the fact that when, p when players come back from Tommy John surgery, their workload load is usually significantly decreased. Yes. And Harvey last year was rolling tons of innings tons of strikes out tons of pitches so he's definitely not gonna be able to fulfill that role that he did this past year with the Mets mm -hmm. so we'll see if that kind of happens I know they have that depth but they definitely want Harvey back I feel like if he's throwing this soon though that he might run into some issues maybe it's not he's not gonna injure himself again they're not gonna go that far but maybe a little bit of setback stuff like that maybe he won't come back for a few months into the season We'll see what happens with that. We'll keep you guys updated on the injury wire. Hopefully there's, no, some, there's not any more big names that are going to be injured. We'll also be keeping you up to date on all the spring training coverage, trades, signings, everything like that. Big news. You will hear it here first at ATV getting to third base. Stay tuned, guys. Hey, welcome back to Sports Zone. We're going to talk a little NBA action in lieu of a throwing it up segment. Uh, consider this the throwing up segment, if you will. We got Deepak, we got NBA Savant alongside. Yes, I have. And uh, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna first start off. You know, we talked uh, we've talked about how awful the Eastern Conference is. There's really only two clear cut contenders, mm -hmm. Indiana and the back to back defending champs, Miami Heat. But you go out west. Uh, you got a much more cloudy field of championship contenders, significantly deeper than the East. And so, Deepak, if you had to pick a team out West that you think could be the favorite to uh, represent the Western Conference in the NBA Finals months from now, who do you think it will be, or could be, or is the favorite to do so? It's got to be the Oklahoma City Thunder. I mean, the Thunder, you know, they've gotten back a healthy Russell Westbrook, who... Yes, that's diminished the scoring monster that Kevin Durant is, uh, you know, his totals, but it's still a great one-two punch, which they've been really handling their own without, uh, you know, James Harden there with them. Um, recently, I believe a day or two ago, they picked up Karan Butler, who, you know, throughout his career, he's, he's an average player right there. He's been averaging about 15 points in his career. Uh, this year, 11 points with about four to five rebounds per game. I mean, and he's had postseason experience. So you have a guy... 
who's a veteran who's really able to carry his own uh, amongst a young team. You know, they'll be there to compete for years. Uh, Dylan, uh, do you agree with uh, GPAC about the uh, OKC Thunder, or uh, will you throw another team in the mix? As of right now, I would have to agree that I think the Oklahoma City Thunder are the number one seed. But like Deepak mentioned, Russell Westbrook coming back, I don't think he's as healthy as he should be. I think that they kind of rushed that a little bit. And you can tell by he's just been off a little bit with his shots. It's definitely taken a lot of points away from KD and a lot of the emphasis away from Kevin Durant, which, I mean, they were rolling when he was. They beat the Heat that one time, and they, they came back from almost like 20 points when they beat them that first time. So if they stay at this rate right now with kind of struggling with Westbrook at the point guard, I'm looking for the uh, Los Angeles Clippers to kind of sneak in right here. You got Chris Paul, Blake Griffin, and right there is a big enough of a one-two punch. Chris Paul lobs it up. Blake Griffin catches it. DeAndre Jordan catches it half the time. Um, <laughs> and, I mean, they're, they're definitely rolling with what they got right there. Yeah. If they can kind of keep up how they're doing, and I think the Thunder have definitely fallen off a little bit mm -hmm. um, just because of Westbrook coming back. But if Westbrook can pick that up, get back to what he was before he was injured, and then continue that, I think the Thunder are definitely the number one seed. So as of right now, Thunder, look for the Clippers coming from behind them. Yeah, it'll be interesting with the Clippers because an issue for them all year has been they're very they're not that deep specifically in the front court. Mm -hmm. They just brought in a, a good friend, Big Baby Davis, who's uh, done terrorizing hotels at night <laughs> down in Central Florida. And uh, Doc Rivers loves the guy. But I thought they could have been possibly a player for Jason Collins who made his return with the Brooklyn Nets, give him a little more size. Big, J uh, Big Baby Davis, despite his nickname, is not huge. He's on like six seven. But anyway, yeah. so we're going to go oh, back oh, to the oh, Eastern Conference, although this guy did play in the Western <coughs> Conference at one yes, point, he did. and uh, mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the answer. Allen Iverson, who had his jersey retired by the Philadelphia 76ers Saturday night, uh, so last night, if uh, for those of you counting at home, because we taped it Sunday night. So, uh, Deepak, you're obviously a Philadelphia guy. I am. I am. So, what what, what <clears throat> is your memory or your lasting memory of uh, Mr. Allen Iverson, a DC product, if you will, coming yes. from Georgetown? Yep. I mean, really, the lasting memory is his just his sheer dominance with his size. I mean, six feet tall, 160 pounds. You know, the way he just absolutely would just make the big guys look just foolish out there. I mean, uh, his big moment was in the 01 finals when he stepped over, um, I forget who it was, but one of the Lakers guys was mm -hmm. down on the ground. After making that shot, he just, you know, no nonsense. He was back uh, playing defense immediately. And, you know, after su such a storied career, um, it's great to see that he came back and, you know, to wrap up his career. And then he, he now has been retired uh, officially by Philadelphia. Soon we'll be talking about him uh, in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, that that will, I can't wait for that induction ceremony. But yeah. you know, Iverson had kind practice. of an inauspicious exit from the NBA. Mm -hmm. But you brought up the Owen Finals, and you look at that team, and that team was awful. Oh yeah, oh. that team had Allen Iverson. <laughs> it had like Eric Snow, Eric McKee, like mediocre to average guys. George Lynch. It's amazing we won at least they one, did have one a, game. They did yeah, have a tumble. Exactly. Though. But, yeah. I mean, Matumbo mm. was a non-factor offensively, basically, at that point. Yeah, but and, and he single-handedly beat the Lakers yes. in game one. Yes. Yeah. And, of course, the Los Angeles ended up winning. But, Dylan, uh, I know you're a big Allen Iverson guy. So, what's your uh, lasting <laughs> memory of Mr. AI? Of course. Uh, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to just say one word, and I'm pretty sure everyone will get it. Practice. Yes. I mean, everyone's yes. got to remember that. Obviously, you know what Allen Iverson did on the court. Just killer crossover, his shot, everything like that. But one of the things that everyone's going to remember Allen Iverson for is practice. That's right. I mean, obviously, he backs it up on the, on the court. He always has, and clearly being inducted into the Sixers Hall of Fame, getting his number retired. And then, like, like Deepak just said, in a few years, we're definitely going to be talking about him getting into the National Basketball Hall of Fame. Absolutely. You know, and everyone loves Springfield Mass. You're a Mass guy. So I am. Yes, I am. Springfield. My so. old man went to college in Springfield, so... Okay. Good times. Good times for everybody. So we got some more sports zone coming on the way, so please stay tuned in. You are watching Sports Zone. Hi there. Welcome to Studio 90. We're going to bring in under close control here. I'm Alan Wynn, joined by Nick and Adrian. And uh, we're going to start off with Studio 90 talking about Champions League this past week. First, uh, first games of round of 16 have concluded over two weeks, and I think the big result that we saw, Olympiakos 
two, Manchester United zero. Uh, let's start off with Nick. Nick, what did you make of the performance and extending into this weekend in the Premier League? Uh, Man United losing. Man United did. Man United oh, did not they, play they this did weekend. Not play this weekend. They did not play this weekend, but we're expecting that they're going to lose whatever game they did play <laughs> because of David Moyes. Um, overall, yes, I would say it's because of David Moyes. There was a lack of signings in the summer transfer window, which he's come under heavy criticism for. Um, overall, the lack of signings has just cost him not only domestically, but in European competition as well. A big problem they've had is the fact that Juan Mata is not eligible for Champions League this season because he was signed in January. Mm -hmm. and. Honestly, David Moyes should be a little bit concerned as of right now. Adrian, what do you what do you make of the situation at the uh, at Man United right now? I also agree. David Moyes is probably the biggest problem because if you look, this is the same team that just last year won the won the Premier League title, and with the same team he inherited, he's guided them to a sixth place um, position in the Premier League, and they're out of both domestic cups. With the Champions League, the only thing left, David Moyes should really have thought a lot more with his selection. Like some of the players he put in, for example, Tom Cleverley should not have even seen first team action that game. And it was obvious from the start that Olympiacos was boosted by their home fans. The team had more fire, more life, and they deserved the 2 0 win. Yeah, I think uh, th there's an issue that we, we saw in the game where, you know, you see a Man United team, you see they're characterized by hard work. They'll get, they'll get the result, even if they don't win. They'll at least look like they want to play. I think this was one of the worst Man United performances mm -hmm. we've ever seen in Europe. Um, Agreed. They showed no ever. life. They didn't really show that lift. They didn't. They, I don't believe they got a shot on target necessarily. Um, and yeah, his team selections have, have been really questioned. And I, I know as a Chelsea fan, you know, it's like, okay, great, Man United are losing. But the fact of the matter is, seeing the difference in, that a year makes, that not even not even a full year makes, um, that's that's certainly been startling. So, what do you make? Do you think he's lost his back room? Do you think he's lost his players' motivation? This, for example, um, Rio Ferdinand, Patrice Evra. Uh, Vidic, for example, is, is already confirmed he's leaving the summer. Uh, Adrian, what do you make of that? I think he's definitely lost something in that back room because, like I said, this is the same team that just one year ago won the like and dominated. I mean, I think the fact that Sir Alex Ferguson is no longer in that locker room has a lot to do with the team. David Moyes just he just doesn't have the track record to back up the team that he's inherited, and just the decisions he made he made have been mind-boggling. And I think that's one of the reasons why you know, the team has become. I guess the laughing stock of the uh, Premier League right now. And Nick, we see a manager from your team, actually, uh, Brendan Rodgers. He's able to, you know, change the change the team shape. He's able to implement different players instead of going wide men today. We'll go, we'll pack midfield and get results. Do you think uh, that's something that he, David Moyes, is sort of stuck in a rut tactically? Do you think with his players? I kind of agree with that. David Moyes is stuck in a rut. He's constantly he's not changing up the formation. Brendan Rodgers, as a Liverpool fan, I love to watch because every week. You'll see one week you'll see him run a 4-3-3 with Coutinho up top right. it, at the, on the left. And the next week you'll see him run s somewhere in a 4-5-1. When Sturridge was hurt, they were running right. a 4-5-1. He's changing it up every week, and that lack of versatility of the Man United side and of David Moyes has cost him. They're continually running a 4-2-3-1, right. and it's continually not getting results. And when something is not getting results like that, Changes should be made, and I think uh, yeah. changes are not being made. And we saw Man United in the past when you know they were really capable when they had a squad similar to this one. They would change it up in, in Europe specifically. Uh, he play, Alex Ferguson would play Wayne Rooney wide left because Rooney would be able to track track runners really well with Patrice Evra, play alone forward and sort of pack the midfield. And you know I think that is a sign of a manager who had a lot of experience. Moyes again. I don't want to hate on him too much. I, it's like I've gotten to this point where you sort of feel bad for the decisions that he's, you know, that he's able to make, that he's even capable of making. He just doesn't seem to really have that there. But moving on to, uh, to you know, some more tactically adept managers, <laughs> managers maybe having a bit more uh, happiness in the Premier League right now, the title race. The title race is still on with Liverpool and Chelsea. And we'll start off with Arsenal with their bad run at Stoke. They've only won nine games since at, at Stoke since 1989 or something like that. Nine league games they've won there. Uh, what did we make of that performance, gentlemen? Well, Stoke is always a really scrappy team. They'll dig out results, and they'll usually dig out a, a draw or at least tough play against the team, even though they aren't doing that great mm -hmm. in the campaign. They're a really scrappy team. They've got some good forwards. They've got Peter Crouch, who he's 
old as anything. Crochino, Crochino, as they call it. <laughs> he is old as anything, but he will get up and get and win headers all the time, right. just because of his sheer size. And they just want the wins, and right. that was seen against Arsenal this week. Yeah, I think it, it's before we get on any further into that game. I think one of the interesting things the teams have said this season is that they've actually gotten points against the big teams at at home. They they beat Chelsea three two. They've beaten Man United. They've taken points off Arsenal. Um, so, Adrian, what do we make? What do we make of their performance? I mean, like you just said, Stoke has a really good record against these good teams. Like they they managed to bring it out against the best competition. Like even though they're not, they don't really have much to play for other than their place in the Premier League. They still managed to just like step it up a notch against these good teams. I mean, Stoke is just one of those teams that likes being the um, what you call it, the, the the underdog, the gritty underdog. There we go. Yeah. Um, so, with final words, uh, with about 12, 10, ga- 10, 12 games left in the season, a little bit more than that, who do you think is going to win the title? We'll start off with Nick. Um, though I would realistically like for it to be Liverpool, I realistically see Man City moving forward. They currently have two games in hand. They'll pick up a third game in hand this week. And even with those games in hand, they're still very close. Right. Adrian? Yes, despite my bias, I still think Chelsea is going to win the league. I mean, Jose Mourinho has managed to get the best out of this team. He may he can switch around the rotation depending on whatever team he plays. He can switch his strategies, whether it's parking the bus against Manchester City or just doing an all-out offensive against another team. You know, that's why I feel like you know he'll manage to bring it in. Yeah, manage to bring him the side of back. For me, I still think, as a Chelsea fan, still think City are going to have it because they have those games in hand and games in hand are handy oh. when it's nice weather outside. They play their games in May. Uh, with that, we're going to chess and volley it back to the studio. This has been Studio 90 with Alan, Nick, and Adrian. All right, folks, welcome back. Uh, we're doing a little basketball heavy action yet again. Uh, we're getting, tapping back into college basketball and talking a little AU athletics. We got our one of our AU insiders, Mr. Nick Papadis, who does stuff for AU athletics. Yes? Just a little bit of stuff. Just sat courtside against Bucknell the other day to run some stats. So got a good view of that game. All right. So, and he brought up the Bucknell game. We'll talk a little bit about that. It was the home finale mm-hmm. for the American Eagles. And it was an interesting game. It was kind of close throughout. Uh, AU led early. Um, but uh, Bucknell really got uh, their offense going late in the first half. Got out to around like a five or six point lead for much of the second half. And AU never really was able to come back. So, Nick, what was your... Uh, initial reactions to uh, Saturday's game? Well, honestly, I think the refs were kind of a little foul-heavy in that game. They called Schof on a lot of fouls in the first half, which forced him to have to sit a lot of the game mm-hmm. playing Marko Vasic. The um, great Marko Vasic. The great Marko Vasic. Um, without Schof, you limit your shooting options a little bit. Vasic can shoot, but just not quite as well as John Schof. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is Schof, did shoot poorly though. You, but you also mm. get guys in the game like Jalen Ray, who's a very good three point shooter. Uh, we also had some Charlie Jones action, but overall, I think we really suffered from the field. We only shot, I believe, thirty four percent from the field, somewhere in that range, and just poor shooting from a team who's based so much around the shot can really cost you a game. Well, I mean, everyone's based on the shot. So the, our <laughs> offense, though, we don't take it to the hole as much as well, right. some teams. Yeah, and, uh, you know, you talked about shooting 34%. We're actually, I don't know what we average, but we're actually, uh, I believe we were second in the nation going into yesterday's or Saturday's game, uh, overall field goal percentage. But, Dylan, you know, like, you know, uh, we were at the game. Mm-hmm. And uh, it just seemed like throughout the game that the Eagles really couldn't get their shots going Really, anybody. They only had one score in uh, double figures, our good friend Jesse Reed. And uh, so what's your take? Yeah, no, that's definitely where the Eagles are struggling this Saturday. Their shots just weren't falling. I mean, they were hitting the backboard. They were hitting the rim, which, I mean, you like to see. They're not airballing them. But it's just nothing was hitting, and you could clearly tell that Bucknell picked up on that early, and they gave them that shot. I mean, there was times where they would be three to four feet off of the AU defend or AU offensive guys, just giving them the open three. Sometimes we took we took it and made it, but a lot of times our guys just didn't even take the shot just because we had been c- so cold from the field. Mm-hmm. 
What I actually would have liked to have seen them do more would have been get it down to Rublicki a little bit more. I think our first out of our first 10 points that we scored, I think Rublicki probably scored about six of them. And a lot of those were just kind of like hooks with his left hand. So I would have liked to have seen them dish it down a little bit more. I know that's not who we are as a team. Like Nick said, we definitely are more of a like just shot-based team, just kind of pull up. We hit a lot of threes usually, but when that wasn't working for us, I feel like you need to adjust a little bit. And they didn't really try to adjust that much. I felt like they were still trying to look for that open shot and we're taking the open shots, but that's because Bucknell was giving it to us because we weren't making them. So I feel like at that point we could have adapted a little bit and I mean, obviously it didn't work out in the end, but that shot just was not falling for us all day. Yeah, Coach Cho with uh, some uh, some hard nose analysis there. You know, you brought up uh, feeding Roblicky more. He he didn't even have that many shots overall in the game. And when he's your sole post guy, because we don't really have, because our four guy is starting for is Kyle Kager, and he like barely played. Yeah, exactly. And I think he also was in a little bit of foul trouble. Yeah, but, but not as much. he really didn't play like at all in the, uh, the the second half, and I don't understand why. I mean, he is a starter. But he only played like seven or eight minutes. But anyways, so yes, uh, Saturday was the final day in Patriot League action. And you had a chance to uh, win the Patriot League title outright, or would it would have won in a tiebreaker had Boston lost. But Boston won and we lost, so ultimately it was for all for naught. So we are the second seed in the Patriot League tournament. Play kicks off on Monday night. We uh, AU will play on Wednesday night. Uh, the winner of the Lafayette Loyola game. Now, the Patriot League tournament, where it's all home seed games, uh, the home seed hosts, I mean, uh, generally, more times than not, you get the one seed is j historically a lock to get into the finals, and the second seed is uh, generally is there as well. Nick, uh, we so uh, do you think we've got a good chance of winning uh, the Patriot League uh, tournament and possibly getting our in? Getting our first, I'm stumbling over words, our first uh, NCAA tournament bid in uh, several years. I think we do have a reasonable shot for the fact we, pl if it does go to Boston, if we play Boston in the finals, which is, as you said, highly likely, we'll have a decent shot against them. We beat them f pretty significantly at home. Yeah. And then when we were on the road in Boston, we played a very close game, which we gave up late in the second half. And it, though they won by a fairly good margin, it was not, they did not dominate that game. Yeah, well, they definitely dominated the second half because there was a significant stretch early in the second half where AU didn't get any points. But Dylan, you know, uh, AU started off very hot, 10-0, uh, mm -hmm. first time ever in conference play to start off. Uh, they, were in, uh, they were in first place, and then they sputtered down the stretch. Uh, they f finished 3-5, and five, still a uh, tied a record for 13 Patriot League Conference wins, but is that kind of inconsistent finish to the year, could that possibly signify uh, some a potential trouble in the Patriot League tournament? I think it is going to uh, show a little bit of trouble that we have right here. I mean, 10-0 and started out great. Like Nick said, we beat, we beat BU by 30 points yeah. here. So if we make it past our first game, then we're going to have to go back up to BU. They're at home. I don't know. I, it, maybe our guys are tired. Their shots aren't falling. I'm not sure what it is, but they definitely just don't look as strong as they did at the beginning of the season. So I'm not even afraid about playing BU and possibly making it into the tournament. I'm more afraid of that first game. I think if they roll well in that first game, they get on to a fast start, they continue that, they're hitting shots, they're going to carry that momentum into the BU game. If they sputter a lot in that game and kind of eke out like a one or two point victory, at that point, I'm kind of scared what's going to happen against BU. It'll probably be a close game still, but I'm just not sure what's going to happen. All right, good insight as always, guys. Uh, stay tuned for some more Sports Zone greatness. Hello and welcome back. This is Sports Zone. As you can tell from this famous two man panel right here, we got the favorite segment on Sports Zone, and this is Shin to Chin with my buddy Brian talking about all the MMA action that's been happening recently in the world. So first, we're going to be talking about Tough China, mm -hmm. Dung Young Kim, huge knockout. Yeah. Absolutely huge knockout. First guy, Hathaway, goes in for an elbow. Dung Young Kim avoids it and then leads with his own spinning elbow to the face. Amazing technique, amazing power. What happened in this fight? 
Right, so Dong Hyun Kim, uh, originally, uh, when he fought in Korea, got his nickname the Stun Gun because of his incredible power. He would stop guys with punches, knees. Um, he's like physically a very strong person. When he came to the UFC, he was sort of a blanket. He yeah. did a, you know, he relied on what he was good at, which is his judo. So a lot of grappling, heavy techniques. Exactly. Um, now, all of a sudden, recently, he's become very much more in tune with his striking. Uh, in a sort of really overly aggressive, sloppy way. But it's not all bad. It's not, you know, he's like an awful striker, but he's just very wild. Yeah. And you see this with a lot of Korean fighters, like the Korean Zombie, uh, Hyun Gyu Lim, Dong Hyun sure. Kim. All of them, they have some very, very nasty power. Uh, they're just a little bit sloppy. Mm. Uh, what we see with Dong Hyun Kim is that he likes certain techniques, like spinning techniques or, or like front kicks to the face, and he will just use it a lot in the fight with really no setup. And I don't think that Dong Hyun Kim landed this by luck because it was very well timed and everything, but uh, he does like to overuse his moves without <laughs> setups, right? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I think what we saw today was Kim kind of like, S like does spams his certain moves and then he just hits them because the guy gets really comfortable and I think uh, what this showed was Kim is a very very aggressive uh, hard hitter and no one's really safe because he's got some crazy takedown defense he's got some crazy takedowns himself mm -hmm. and now he's got some you know pretty insane power behind all of his techniques and he's yeah. a very unorthodox person makes him a very hard opponent to, to train for, for sure. Yeah, I mean, when you're knocking people out with, with spinning elbows, mm -hmm. usually you're, you don't really see a lot of knockouts like that. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, use them, but like you said, it's more kind of video game techniques. Right, when you see especially fighters. elbows, a lot of cuts, you don't see a lot of knockouts, like no. one hit knockouts off an elbow. That's, that that's was what impressive. It was, that's what yeah. it was. I mean, obviously he had been hitting him for a little bit, it had been mm -hmm. building up to it, but just one strong elbow, he's down, mm -hmm. and this is having this is putting him into the the title fight contention. People right. are saying at least, as we know, the next big title fight is Johnny Hendrick versus Robbie Lawler, mm -hmm. and this is the fill-in fight for GSP's belt after he vacated and is taking a break from the UFC. Mm -hmm. So after that fight, people are saying that Stun Gun's going to jump right in. He's going to get the next title shot. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to happen? I think uh, it shouldn't happen. It could happen, but it shouldn't. Uh, the matter of fact is that the guys that Dong Hyun Kim has fought are very good fighters. None of them are top 10 contenders, really. Uh, none of them are top contenders for the belt. Uh, Eric Silva and John Hathaway, uh, not, really, not really like top five level guys. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what this does is actually puts Dong Hyun Kim into a position to fight for the top contendership. So that's a very good opportunity for him, and we'll see how it goes on from there. Yeah, no, that's definitely some... We'll, we'll see what happens. Maybe he's making a little bit of a UFC comeback right now. Mm -hmm. But going on from that, we're going to go to probably the biggest news of the week. And I know this was covered, maybe not worldwide, but definitely on a lot of news station. ESPN covered it, which doesn't happen a lot. But that was the state of Nevada banning the use of TRT. Mm -hmm. And the UFC's followed suit. They said, okay, we're going to pick up this ban. We're also going to implement it, mm -hmm. which, okay, makes sense. TRT's received a lot of criticism recently, mainly for some big-name fighters like Vitor right. Belfort and Dan Henderson. Mm -hmm. But what's been the most surprising of this is not that the ban happened. People knew this was going to be happening. But the fact that shortly after this ban comes into play, Vitor Bel Belfort drops out of his next fight. Right. Now, as you guys remember, Vitor has been working his way up. He had a nice knockout of Michael Bisping. He beats Dan Henderson as well, right. and now he was going to be fighting Chris Weidman for the belt, mm -hmm. but Vitor drops out. Why the sudden dropout? No more TRT? Well, yeah, actually, to put it bluntly, it is. Uh, Vitor Belfort, ac uh, according to his physician, said he needs 90 days to get off his TRT, so it's still in the SIF system, and he, can't, he shouldn't be training with it when they're pulling him out, uh, off of it. Yeah. Uh, I don't whether that's true, that's probably true, but uh, the matter of fact is that his test results were also being announced that day, and he doesn't have to announce it because he's pulling out of the fight. Now, a lot, he's gotten a lot of criticism about his TRT and about you know previous steroid use or current steroid use, he could be. Um, so if he just came out and said that, hey, look at my test results that are clean, uh, I think he would put a lot of doubters, uh, shut up a lot of doubters, but he hasn't done it. And it kind of looks fishy when the day of, his uh, his steroid uh, his drug tests come out or supposed to be announced yeah. along with the TRT ban and etc. He pulls out of the fight 
Anyway, Machida stepping in for it, which is uh, which is going to be an interesting fight anyway. Uh, so I, I can't wait to look forward to that. No, that's yeah. definitely going to be an interesting fight to watch. And maybe Vitor's going to come back after that. Mm -hmm. We'll yeah. see what happens with that. But that's all the big news that we've been talking about for MMA. That's what's going on in the MMA world. We'll see you guys next time for some more MMA action. And remember, you got to watch that spinning elbow. You don't want to get it caught. Bam. See you guys next week. Bye. See ya. Welcome back, friends. Uh, we're going to do a little thumbs up, thumbs down action, our favorite segment. Uh, we got our, uh, our good buddy uh, Adrian Cruz in the mix. So we're going to start off with Dylan, his thumbs up, thumbs down for whatever's going on in, in his world. Yeah. All right, let's start this off. We're going to start off with thumbs down. I don't know, I feel like you usually start off with thumbs down. That way you end it on a high note. Mm -hmm. But thumbs down is going to go to midterms week. I know everyone at ATV is just a little bit, little bit on edge, a little bit stressed. We got tests, papers, anything else, final projects, a lot of things that people are trying to get done before midterms. So good luck to everyone out there. But I mean, I know studying for tests, never the most fun thing to do. I guess another thumbs down to that, it'll, it'll be a thumbs up at the same time, but it's gonna start out thumbs down is impending snowstorm. Um, I love snow, I'm from New England. I feel like it should not be snowing in DC anymore if it's March. So I don't know what's gonna happen with that. It's just a little bit weird. Thumbs up though for the possible snow day. Mm. Knock on wood, we don't know if that's happening yet. But possible snow day, extra day to study for midterms, which I know I'm gonna be using that for. I don't know about anyone else here at uh, ATV Sports Zone. But gonna roll, keep rolling with that thumbs up. Thumbs up, I mentioned it earlier but Springs Trading has officially started. It is underway. That brings us that much closer to opening day in April. So that's gonna be starting. You got some news going out, injury reports, which are never good, but that's gonna be ramping up a little bit. We got another thumbs up to actually a pretty good crew today. We had a lot of people show up, which I'm liking it. We got a few new people. Um, you, saw, you saw Dan, he's on our show earlier. We got him, Adrian, showing up for another week, Nick showing up for another week. So we got some new guys showing up, which is really good. And my last thumbs up, Brian and I talked about it in our big fight segment, but the elbow by Dong Young Kim, the brutal knockout elbow. I don't know if you guys have seen this. Check it on my Facebook. Brian sent it to me. The tough China finale. He uh, goes in, it looks at first like it's a spinning back fist. And he ends up clipping this guy with an elbow right under his eye, and the guy drops like a sack of potatoes. I suggest you guys check it out. It's one of the quickest, quickest way to end the fight. It's definitely very entertaining. So that's it for my thumbs up, thumbs down for the week. All right, Adrian. All right, for me, thumbs down, pre-spring break stress. <laughs> I know just like he said earlier, we have all the midterms and stuff. Oh, I mean, like the midterms and stuff. You know, I personally, I have so many projects to do. I have a video due tomorrow that I haven't even started with, so I'm going to be having a date with F Final Cut Pro tonight. And in general, it's just stress. I mean, how, what more can you explain for it? Also, thumbs down, English soccer teams this weekend. Both Manchester United and Arsenal have given pitiful performances. Manchester United failing in Greece, you know, losing 2-0 to Olympiacos, and their season is pretty much over. David Moyes is just... A failure, it seems like, and it's just, it's just a struggle. And then with Arsenal also losing to Stoke City, that all those memories of first place seem long gone. As Chelsea seems like they're going to be taking over the Premier League, and you know, thumbs up, Masahiro Tanaka. His first outing in a Yankees uniform was a success. He showed the good stuff. He showed that nasty splitter that we've all been raving about. While he did have some trouble in the beginning. It's, you know, it's first game jitters. He'll do fine, and I predict him to have a very good career in a Yankees uniform. All right. Yeah. So, thumbs down to the uh, state of Maryland. I just feel like giving some hate to the state of Maryland. Why Maryland? So, well, hmm. because that's what I want to do, Dylan. Okay, just well, asking. It's what okay. did Maryland ever do to you? Uh, I'm hating on Maryland right now. <laughs> right. I don't like it. And I also didn't come planned with any thumbs up, thumbs down for the most part, so... <laughs> Not thumbs busted. down to that. Uh, thumbs up. March is here. Now, it is still cold because March is still technically a winter month. Technically, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it is. Yeah. Uh, but you got March Madness right around the corner. I'm so excited because we got conference championship tournaments 
starting this week, even though it's generally the lower tier, we still, but it's still going to be great. Uh, I'm very excited for, uh, you know, you got the Patriot League action, mm-hmm. you got Atlantic Sun, the Horizon League, they got Arch Madness, Missouri Valley Conference, so it's going to be awesome. So thumbs up to that. Uh, thumbs up to Take Home Midterms. I got a mm. Take Home Midterm due Wednesday, Lucky. which is great. Uh, thumbs down to my Zonal Graphic Art class because I've got a non take home midterm <laughs> on Friday, my last class before going on spring break. Ooh, rough. Ouch. So that'll be, uh, that'll be great. And thumbs up to, and you know, last week, as you know, I wasn't here. And they actually had a show, which I wasn't expecting. So there's that. Thumbs up to that. Dylan, all those. Students that were there, mm-hmm. uh, man. That's about it. So for everybody here at Sports Zone ATV, uh, I'd say AU Media, but I don't mean that. Um, sorry, I hate them people. Um, but besides uh, random grudges aside, and sorry, folks from the state of Maryland, uh, this has been Sports Zone. I'm Ben Florence. We'll see you next time.